This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 11. Now before we begin, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins according to 1 John 1, 9. And at the same time, we want to make sure that we're allowing the Spirit to control us. We do that by giving ourselves over to Him. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege, the freedom that we still have to study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds will be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. In our last lesson, we continued to look at the conduct of the church, specifically the walk of the believer. Now, when I say conduct of the church, that is exactly what this passage is referring to. Not unbelievers, not the world. Just because you see a lot of things about deeds of darkness and things like that, it doesn't mean this doesn't go on in the hearts and minds of believers who go to a assembly and meet with other believers. But that's what this is talking about. It's not addressing unbelievers, not the world. It's being around your fellow Christians. These unfruitful deeds of darkness are of believers who are playing in the dark. You've heard me talk, if you've been with me long enough, about baby, baby believers still uh, in the spiritual playpen of immaturity. Paul addresses them. Uh, sometimes... Uh, Things are said like they can't eat the meat of the word. But maybe you can give them some milk. Now, these are believers who have some truth, but have learned to hide their sins around other believers. And everyone listening knows exactly what I'm talking about. We've all been there. Perhaps many of us are still there. These are things we do in secret, shameful things, sinful activity can be deception, manipulation, not telling all the truth about matters, uh, hiding uh, sinful habits, hiding activities that we don't want others to know about. They're called uh, uh, shameful things, things done in secret. This is going to be strong medicine that goes to the heart of every church, and every believer, because it's not talking about just the deeds of people, but the very people. Not just about our deeds, but us. As people of light, we are to live light, in the light, do things, listen to this, in the light. Whatever we hide or attempt to hide, that's doing it in darkness. And it's always best, now listen up, it's always best for it to be made known. That's how you deal with it. And what makes it all the more challenging, there are a few believers around to help you deal with it. You may be alone. And I'm going to make a prediction. When you start to live your life in the light, as this passage is teaching us. When you step up to living at the level of what you are, a child of light, you're going to enter new battles, and they're going to be close in. It's going to be close combat, you might say. Well, let's get on with it. We've been looking under Roman numeral 2, the conduct of the church. Here's the general outline. Walk in unity, walk in holiness, walk in love, and we are still about to finish up. Walk in light. 5, 7 through 14. We started there. Let's go back and read what we've already studied. Ephesians 5, 7. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. This is an active, ongoing activity that growing Christians always have. You're trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. You want to identify a positive believer? He's always studying. I don't mean always every moment of the day, but he is seriously spending time daily in his life in the Word of God. Now, we started the section, section D, walking in the light, like I just read back in verse 7. It goes to 14. Let's pick it up in verse 11. And verse 11 addresses another issue we're to be doing. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. Now, there's two major par parts to this uh, verse. First part, I just highlighted it. And there's two words you want to look at there. And do not participate. The word participate. Sung koi no neo. All right. See the word soon, it means with. We see the word koi no neo. It's to share with. So this means to associate with someone in some activity, a joint sharing, a connection with. The other word we want to look at. I'm not going to deal with the Greek on this. It's obvious. Unfruitful works are two works, two words you might say. These are works that are unproductive. All right, now we've studied enough of that already. We know what that is. Notice the source of those unfruitful works of darkness. That's where they come from. We've already been told that we weren't once were in darkness, described it as once in darkness or formerly darkness back in verse 8. Darkness would include anything done of sin, evil, or wickedness. And that is in contrast to the fruit of the light we saw back in verse 9. Remember that? For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, you might say the other side of the coin is don't participate in unfruitful works of darkness. Why would a child of light want to revert back to doing things he did in darkness as an unbeliever? The place where we were held in sin and captive to sin. Next line. But instead, even expose them. Now, there are some words here we want to spend some time on. We're going to look at uh, for the first, well, look at the first four, let's put it that way. But instead, even expose. Of course, then refers back to these unfruitful works. Okay. Well, we know what but means. It means uh, it's a contrast. It's a word of contrast. All right. So we have a contrast. But there's an additional word here. Uh, what we would call a comparative adverb. Instead or rather. But, you know, we could just use but, but expose them. But no, we have an additional word. But instead, it's going to give us something to do. And then we have another word that makes it even stronger. Even. This is called a, this is a conjunction. Okay. It's called an ascensive conjunction. It takes it up another level. I want you to see the emphasis here. Emphasis here. I'm talking too fast. But instead, even expose them. All right, so, but, instead, even. Now, let's just talk about what we have so far. We're going beyond just not participating in them. Okay, that was a previous line. There are some fine points here. We're going to learn them here. So, that's why we're spending some time on it. So, we're going beyond uh, not participating in them now, but even, but instead, even expose them. Okay, I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to 
expose what they are. Whoa. That's an additional job, so to speak. Let's talk about the word expose. Four basic meanings in the usage, in its usage in the uh, New Testament. Now we're in verse 11. Just want to remind myself of that because when we look at this, I want us to see the word alongco. First meaning, there's our verse. All right. To scrutinize or examine carefully, bring to light, set forth, or expose. Okay, got it? Expose. Second meaning. Oh, let me let me uh, just make a comment here. Unbelievers avoid the light so as not to be exposed and show them to be shown guilty. That's one of the usages back in John 3.20. All right, you see that? Unbelievers avoid the light so as not to be exposed. Uh, they prefer the darkness. If they came out in the light, they'd be shown guilty, so they avoid it. But that's not addressing, this is not addressing unbelievers in our passage. We see the Ephesians 5.11 and 13 reference. We're in verse 11 now. Another meaning, to bring a person to the point of recognizing wrongdoing, convict, refute, convict of sin is the idea. We see that use within the church, 1 Corinthians 14.24, John 8.46, 16.8, Jude 1.15. Now these are uh, uh, instances where you're going to deal with believers. We also see that this is what the Word of God does in 2 Timothy 3.16. It's what the Holy Spirit does. John 16, 8 through 11. Another meaning of this word, elanco, uh, el el elanco, <laughs> is three, to express strong disapproval of someone's action, correct, reprehend severely, admonish, and reprove. And we can see these overlaps, right? Now, this is interesting because John the Baptist does that with Herod in Luke 3, 19 and brings up another issue. Jesus with rulers. He did some uh, disapproval of people's actions, did he not? And then again, believers, Matthew 18, 15, anticipating the church, believers, uh, the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy 5, 20, 2 Timothy 4, 2, those are done in the church too, but we see a slightly different nuance in the usage there. And then there's divine discipline in Revelation 3, 19. Now, we could combine... Definitions 1 and 2 together and 3 to 4, uh, but we can see there's overlap throughout. But I want you to get the idea. It just depends particularly on the situation. Also, another split you might say, sometimes the uh, persons is addressed. So he's told what his sin is. Another time, it's the act itself that's exposed. So a person can be exposed or the act can be exposed. When a person is exposed, it involves conviction, follows uh, with reproof or rebuke, and discipline. This would be in a church in particular. To an act, as here, the deeds or works are exposed. So we now have an understanding of what exposed means. We have seen that as believers, we've been commanded to walk as children of light with the expected fruit of all goodness, righteousness, and truth while learning what pleases the Lord, not participating in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even exposing them. Folks, I can tell you, that when you start to do this, a couple of things you got to be cautious about. First of all, as we saw earlier, we are made aware we're to clean up our own inner life. Make sure we're not being the hypocrite. And when we're covering our own sins, our hidden sins, we know 
we're hypocrite. That may be why we're not exposing anybody because we're hiding our own sins. And that's a common problem. In fact, some churches, uh, they don't deal with people's sins even though they're obvious in the church because so many are covering up their own. And that's a shame, but that's the truth. When it comes to deeds of darkness, there are many all around us. Uh, so it's all over the place. We're not to participate and instead go one step further and expose what they really are. Folks, this is really strong medicine. I've probably said that a few times here. But this is what children of light do. Their light exposes the wrongdoing, the evil, the wickedness, the deception, the lies, how harmful it is to your fellow believer. And another thing, this is an imperative, right? Expose, command, okay? Uh, it's what we call a iterative meaning. It means repeated action. When you have the opportunity to expose a deed of darkness, you expose it. You do this again and again. Now, I know we're quick to say, hey, those guys on television with these politicians, those, those evildoers out there, they're always doing this or that. And I hear believers also on these some of these news programs, um, they'll claim to be believers and they're exposing it. And that's fine. You want to expose evil, you want to expose bad stuff. But in their own lives, are they doing it uh, to themselves, I mean, do they bring their own sins out of the light and deal with them too? I don't mean right there on public TV, but are they personally doing that within their churches, within their fellowships, within themselves? But this is to be done again and again. So this is, well, you've heard people say, well, that's a mouthful. This is quite a brainful, okay? There's a lot here. we got to grasp this and think about it. Because, remember, Ephesians is for advanced, growing believers. And now we're doing some real refining to our hearts and minds. And I'll be the first to tell you, tell you this really challenges me. So, I'm sure it challenges all of us. Now, there's a related point here I want to talk about now. And this is a key point. It's an important point. The question is whether Christians are to rebuke unbelievers. But let me make it clear. First of all, this passage, we need to remember, Paul is addressing believers in the church. However, out in the world, we are in contact with unbelievers on a regular basis who are deep into sin. That shouldn't surprise us. What do we expect? We, if you know your theology, uh, you're not going to let people's sin out there, especially unbelievers, upset you too much. Where it upsets me, and I think is perfectly legitimate, is when it affects you or affects your government or your state or your freedom. But when people are out there dealing in their sin, what, what kind of movies do we expect them to make? What what we expect an unbeliever to do? He's going to... Uh, He's going to entertain those lusts of the flesh. Now, there's an ongoing battle out there between morality and immorality on a regular basis. And it plays out before us. We see it on the news. Uh, even mainstream propaganda, that's the news nowadays, they promote immorality that the state promotes. And as we have seen over the last several years, it's gotten not just more sinful, but evil. Evil. Uh, and I'm not talking about just the gross sin, the homosexuality, the transgenderism, but the promotion of laws and movements that work against freedom and the opportunity for us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, well, to, in a couple of words, global 
Marxism. And many countries are now dealing with the influence of global Marxism in their own country, in their own nation. And of course, global Marxism means to erase the principles of nationalism. You remember this, Satan is always attacking the divine institutions that God established. He's attacking our individual freedom. He's attacking marriage, family, nationalism. And the additional institution is the church. So these are always under attack. And you see it throughout at many levels, in politics, in, in uh, uh, the changing of the laws. Certainly it's been an entertainment uh, basically all our lives. It's always been that way. Entertainment has basically always been directed towards the unbeliever. Now, the question again, are Christians to rebuke the unbeliever in his sin? Paul's not addressing that here. Paul would not exhort those of the world to not participate in deeds of darkness. What else are they going to do? Unbelievers are controlled and dominated by their sinful nature. Deeds, deeds of darkness comes natural by them. But Paul is addressing those who once were in darkness. However, there are occasions when a believer would rebuke an unbeliever. Let me give you a clear example. An example is when John the Baptist rebuked Herod Antipas for his unlawful marriage to Herodias, Mark 6.18. Both had been divorced. Both divorced their spouses, in fact, to marry each other. Herod married Herodias. Both had been uh, previously married both had divorced their spouses to marry each other, and Herodias was his half-brother Philip's former wife. So this is against the Mosaic Law. Uh, John the Baptist was still living under the Mosaic Law. That's, that's the, basically what goes on in the early part of the New Testament, of the, I should say, gospel specifically. Uh, Christ lived under the law. Uh, the laws we're talking about here in particular, Leviticus 18, 16, and 20, 21. Leviticus 18, 16, and 20, 21. So they violated the law. In addition, Herod had done many other evil things, and uh, this comes out in Luke 3, 19. So John the Baptist rebukes the leader, uh, their local uh, authority, Herod Antipas. Okay? He was a ruler. So, when he does rebuke the unbeliever, there are special conditions here. Let's keep them in mind. At the time, they were still living under the law, as I just mentioned. They were also in the area of Judea or Galilee. Antipas actually ruled up in Galilee. And John the Baptist was a prophet still living and operating under the uh, Mosaic Law, the Old, the Old Testament, as we call it, compared to the New or the Old Covenant, Matthew 11, 11 through 14. So he was, in effect, an Old Testament prophet. And one of the Old Testament prophets' duties, if you ever study the prophets, you probably have to some degree, was to rebuke and warn rulers, of which Herod was. Herod was tetrarch over Galilee and Perea during the whole period of our Lord's life on earth, Luke 23, 7. Now, we could not meet the conditions of John today when he rebuked Herod. But what can we do and what should we do? As believers, we've already been taught in this passage we were formerly in darkness as unbelievers. We're no longer to live like that. As children of light, we produce acts of goodness, righteousness, and truth, and please the Lord. We find out what pleases the Lord. We're always searching for that, always learning. We've been told we're not to share with those who do unfruitful works of darkness. 
but instead expose them. Does unfruitful works of darkness include the unbeliever? Of course. But here Paul's specifically addressing believers in the church of Ephesus. So the direct application is believers. There's an overlap of application, of course, any deeds of darkness, wherever they are. Now, to see them, uh, in order to expose them, we would either have to be present or at least knowledgeable of these dark works. So we would expose them through both our contrasting lifestyle and the light, the way we live. We don't go along with it. We don't agree with it. We don't do it. That's a way of exposing them if we're children of light. And then there are times when we are to rebuke them, verbally rebuke them, say something, refute it, expose it, say how evil it is, how wrong it is. Transgenderism is evil. We don't want that influence in our society that overlaps into the lives of our families. So clearly there are times that we rebuke our fellow believers as well as what's going on in society. One of the things that I think Christians uh, fail to recognize, and, and yet maybe some don't, but uh, of course, but there are those uh, that have to understand that our culture is derived from the level, or we might say, just morality, the level of morality in our society. If there's very little morality, the culture is going to be all lining up with sin. If there's morality, at least you can curb that and respect the divine institutions of free will, uh, marriage, family, and nationalism. Now understand, nationalism is basically saying you don't believe in uh, internationalism. In other words, one world government. We see very early in Scripture that God established nationalism back in Genesis 10 and 11 when he broke up the Tower of Babel and divided people into their languages. Furthermore, we see divisions with uh, skin color culture, location, geographical boundaries, and that's all good. Okay, that's all good. If there's a crossover, like in uh, skin color, that's fine as long as you have the same culture. And when I include culture, as I just mentioned, the same understanding of morality. And that uh, is reflected in your laws and what you think is right and wrong. And you have to have nationalism, and the reason is because it protects the freedom of those who believe that we're to have law and order according to morality. So let's just look at the board for a moment. So you have the United States, okay, and we have certain moral principles that we live by, okay? It's, it's really changed now, but let's just go back a few years where we had morality, and we believed that uh, marriage was between a man and a woman that we have free will, that we have basic uh, natural rights, which we do, okay? Life, for instance, freedom, uh, the freedom to protect yourself, that's part of life, that's an extension of your right to life, okay? So you have another country over here, I could name it, just, just put the word communist, okay? The communist believes in certain type of morality, uh, and we would call some of that immorality. We believe over here in the morality property rights. You can own property. It's yours. No one has the right to take it from you. And under communism, 
you often have some form where the government owns it, owns your property, or they have so much control over it that basically they control it. That's more of the idea of socialism, okay? That's where you get kind of one grade below. You have socialism, okay? Of course, United States, we believe in the uh, Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, uh, free to live your life as long as it's within the bounds of the law within morality. And when the changes start to occur, as they are in the United States right now, people start to adopt some of these laws of uh, socialism, communism, where you basically want to control the world as much as you can. Um, religions do the same thing. And we as Christians are to uphold the moral principles that stem from Scripture and moral laws where we have laws that are based upon morality of Scripture I don't kid yourself. Morality is throughout the scripture. We know that. But we also have that in eight uh, principles that God gave us all as human beings, where there's basically, we know, between right and wrong. Okay? My point overall is you have to keep nationalism. Nationalism, nationalism keeps uh, the United States, the United States under its moral principles. Communism keeps them under their moral principles. So they have their nation, and we have our nation. We are believe in freedom, freedom of religion, freedom to protect ourselves. We have Second Amendment rights, freedom to bear, which means carry, to hold on to, to walk around with arms. And that's been limited. Many of our rights are being limited. Uh, under communism, go back and look at the history of communism. One of the first things you see they do, they disarm their citizens. They disarm their citizens. It happened in Nazi Germany. It happens under socialism. It happens under communism. And what you end up doing when you disarm your citizens, you set yourself up for a tyrant. So there's no way, all right, there's no way to counter the tyranny uh, when it goes, well, let's put this way, when it gets completely out of hand. You do that. You can't defend yourself. You can't protect your family. They can come and take your family members, as they would do. We want to take your children so we can develop them to be uh, better state citizens. Okay? Now, these are the type of things we need to address in our society. And we can expose that in uh, the unbeliever realm because that affects us in the United States. Now, I know many of you listen to this from all around the world. And some of you are restricted in what you can listen to when it comes to the gospel. There are some countries uh, that won't let you have a Bible, even online. It's restricted. And we keep those type of bad laws out of our country by maintaining our own laws within our nation. And that's why we are members of a nation. We believe strongly in a nation, and we are nationalists. Now, I know there's some terms flying around now, Christian nationalism. Well, I don't know how they define that exactly, but... It's probably in a negative way, but we believe in nationalism as Christians, and we are Christians. Now, you want to change the definitions of the terms? Well, you better make sure that they understand what you, you mean as nationalism. We don't believe in globalism, and today that's often what people are promoting is globalism. And as I said, Marxist globalism. And folks, this is evil. So we want to rebuke it so we can maintain our moral principles, our culture, and continue to be free to evangelize and to attend the church we want. We don't want to have to be forced to put up 
a uh, well as they did in Germany uh, a Nazi flag uh, at, at the altar that's despicable it's despicable and that was a battle people fought there this is a battle that people have fought throughout the generations it went on in Europe the Catholics fighting the Protestants, even Protestants fighting Protestants. Um, the combined uh, uh, combination, I should say, of uh, government with the church, that always leads to tyranny. That means you get government making rules for the church. You don't want that. You want that freedom. Okay? So there's where some rebuking would come in outside of the church. Now, back to our passage. And our particular subject is exposing, rebuking, refuting those activities that go on within the church. Jesus taught to tell one's brother, that is a Christian, his fault. There's our word, elango. In Matthew 18, 15. Compare that with Leviticus 19, 17. So there are times we are to rebuke our fellow believers. If we love them, we should. And as I mentioned, rebuking is strongly taught in the pastoral epistles as part of the pastor's responsibility. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 20. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Titus 1, 9. 13, 2, 15. I've done that. In fact, I just did it. We are to rebuke those who uh, don't believe in nationalism, who don't believe in our rights of life to protect ourselves, our freedoms to speak. How are you supposed to live without speaking freely? Well, in some countries you can't, as startling as that may sound. Now, other words are used for the believer to help hold accountable another believer in sin. We see that in James 5, 19, 21, to bring believers back to a uh, close walk with the Lord. Now, let me just make sure you understand this, because there are some people who will avoid this like the plague. I have, they'll say things like, we have no business straightening out other believers. Wrong, wrong wrong. And what happens is they may take someone like the Pharisees who were self-righteous about it and harsh and downright mean and cruel and physically punish people and say, well, that's the kind of stuff you're going to get into. No, not if you do it right. So there's a way to speak to believers who are walking in sin, who are doing damage uh, to the church or their families, you always do it out of love and concern for our fellow brother and sister, not self-righteously or with anger. But our objective is to get them back right with the Lord. I'll write people letters now and then. Some will even tell me they've been away from the Lord. And that's why I haven't heard from them for months or maybe years. And I'm very happy to have them back with the Lord, of course. Glad to hear from them again. But I urge people all the time to stay faithful. It's an ongoing battle. But when it comes to unbelievers, there may be an occasion to address and rebuke them about their sin. You know, if you don't do that let's say it's about their children. If you don't do that regarding your child, they're just going to get worse on you. And you can do that to someone you know personally. Or someone at work may ask you a question about, how do I deal with this? Well, not only can you help them on principles of morality, but that may lead to a friendship and gospel, particularly the gospel. When I say friendship, I mean enough to get to know them to give them the gospel. I warn people about being friends with the unbeliever because to maintain that, you often have to get into their bailiwick of activity, and that's often involves sin. Okay? 
But if you have an unbeliever who's in a position to hurt you or your loved ones because they have authority over you with their sinful acts and and uh, you're in a position to call them to account, you do so. That's one of the nice things about being a Christian in a free country where you can vote. You can call your leaders to account by voting them in or out. That's why we want moral leaders. You know, what do you do when boys uh, claim to be girls and they want to go into your children's, your girl's locker room at school? Well, first thing I would do is probably blow up. But then again, that's me. But, uh, you know, what gives them that right? Or vice versa, girls want to go into boys' locker rooms. I haven't heard that one a lot. <laughs> I think that just tells you what's going on with the boys sometimes. Uh, another thing that's going on in our country right now, right now is uh, people are unfairly judging others in the courtroom system. Sometimes that's believers are being unfairly judged. That should be spoken out against. You say, well, wait a minute. Aren't those authorities? Yes, but we also have the freedom of speech to criticize and try to correct those authorities. Uh, they're not tyrants. They're not supposed to be. So we have the freedom to challenge those things in a number of ways, and we should. What if you're in a department store and someone's tried to cheat you? I think you know what I mean. There's many examples. It's priced wrong. Uh, it was in the wrong place. And now someone's trying to cheat you. Well, our moral values kick in. They're being violated. And we react to the injustice and the unfairness and the gross sin. Or we're overcharged or unfairly charged. Or there's too many fees. Nothing wrong with claiming, claiming unfairness, if that's the case. However, the primary objective with the unbeliever, and I'm not, I'm not talking about those particular occasions I just mentioned. The primary objective with the unbeliever regarding is regarding his sin is to evangelize and witness to the unbeliever. And it's important to understand that in this context, the believer is exposing primarily the dark deeds of other believers. This is not an admonition to go out to the world and try to straighten out the world and expose all the unbelievers' evils. That's not where, where to do that. Paul doesn't do that. Jesus didn't do that. In certain situations, certain cases, often personal, there are times you do say things that uh, you say to the unbeliever. What if you see a, an unbeliever uh, shoplifting, or anyone on shoplifting for that matter? Do you report it? In many cases, I think you would. But then again, many stores don't do anything anymore because they're so afraid of doing anything anymore. But with believers, we want them to come to repentance and expose the dark deeds to them. Primarily, let the con conviction process begin. If it's an entire church, wow. And that's often happening too. Many churches are into apostasy. And uh, that needs to be pointed out as well. That's doubtful that they'll be convicted of it. Uh, you might be able to get an individual on the side and say, you know, the Bible doesn't teach that. And that, again, is... Uh, a good example here of uh, deeds of darkness, if they're into deeds of darkness. But our passage is on a personal level and within the church body, and let's keep that in mind. There are some passages that address this very issue. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 12. Let's see, 11, 12, and 13. I'm going to do 11 through 13. I'll put it on the board for you. You can just read along with me. This is my translation. Paul writes, But now I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or idolater or verbally abusive or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So there's where you got to watch your fellowship with unbelievers. 
and I use that word in general terms here, not specifically uh, church fellowship, okay? 12. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? See there, that's exactly what we're studying right now. God judges those outside. He deals with those out there who have rejected Christ. Okay? Again, like I said, we're not here to judge the world. God will do that. But in the church, let's go back to our verse 13, expel the evil person from among you. You have one of those in your church. You don't want to change. He wants to continue his evil activity. He is, uh, let's say he's running around with all the women or uh, uh, she's in business deal and she's uh, evil in her business practices. She's getting people into her business and so she can take advantage of them and con them perhaps. Expel them if they don't, if they don't straighten out right away. Your witness to the unbeliever is to live the righteous life and let them see your light in your production. If you want truth, if they want truth, I should say, they will come to the light. And that includes coming to you. Now, before we move on to the next reason to not get involved with those deeds, let's look at the obvious. Since we're talking about being around believers here, what does that tell us about Christian associations? We have to be just as careful around believers and their lifestyle as unbelievers. Now, I say that in our day and time, for our day and time. It's unwise to let your guard down around people who call themselves believers unless you know them well enough to say and be convinced they are faithful and righteous uh, acting believers. Okay? You can't read everybody's mind, obviously. We know that around unbelievers that things can get immoral quickly if they're not already that way. But around believers who are not walking with the Lord, not growing spiritually, their lifestyle can also be unproductive. In other words, if the thrust of this passage is you being around believers who are playing in the dark, then you must be all the more cautious in guarding your own behavior around other Christians. Don't get caught up in their sinful activity. You go to a party or something where there's a bunch of mediocre Christians and they don't mind uh, drinking too much and getting a little drunk and, and using uh, bad language, doing things that are sinful, things that are harmful, things that are, well, even evil, then you need to stay away. Perhaps you need to do some exposing. And you won't be invited to that party again, uh, anymore. To me, I think this passage helps us. The biggest red flag around people who claim to be believers is not so much they're being good, but are they seriously righteous? Are they living truth? And I'm telling you folks, one of the best uh, uh, measurements to uh, judge fellow believers regarding their spirituality is uh, are they trying to to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. In other words, are they growing spiritually? Do they show a deep hunger for truth and devotion to follow Jesus? Or they may just be in that group that always wants to know, oh, what's your view on this? Oh, what's your view on that? You know, and they're just curious. They're not really going to take it to heart and, and uh, live it, but they'll have the right view. That's what you got to watch out for too. That's religious people. They're basically correcting their conduct according to the view they want to agree with. And in my view, most Christians are religious. They do the things that are expected of most Christians. They attend church, they pray, they worship. They maybe somehow uh, serve in the church. They teach a Sunday school, help around the church, uh, live respectable moral lives on the surface, and that's fine. But do they go deeper and live righteously, growing spiritually, studying the word seriously, 
witness in life and word. Let me insert a couple of words here in some of our verses, just to, just for application's sake, okay? This is not the scripture, but this is putting some words in that help us apply. I'll do it on a couple of verses, a couple of points we've seen that are verses. Let no one, including Christians, deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Remember that one? But well, we have the word Christians in here. Do not become partners with those types of Christians. Back to our passage and the reason for exposing their unfruitful deeds. We've been away from our passage for some time now. Verse 12. So we finished verse 11, but instead even expose them, verse 12, for the things done in secret by them are shameful even to mention. Here's why. Four introduces the reason why. The things done, all right, in, the word in, it's what we call a dative of manner here. Uh, this is the manner in which they are done. They are done in secret. The word secret is crufe, secretly. It's the only use in the New Testament. What they do is so bad, it's too shameful to talk about to others. They don't want others to hear uh, what they've been doing. Uh, it's, it's shameful. And it says, by them. That goes back to those in uh, verse 7. Those you're not to become partners with. The things done in secret are those words and acts that are sinful deeds of darkness that people who do them, do them undercover. They are called shameful. The word for shameful, ice cross. Uh, just as we might expect, it means socially or moral, morally unacceptable, disgraceful, base, sordid. Some are so shameful that even unbelievers would not mention them. This is why they do them in the dark. Let me remind you that Paul is addressing believers at Ephesus, but the principle applies to all believers. They're too shameful even to mention, too shameful to talk about. If these deeds are so shameful even to mention, then why expose them, you might say? First, it's an effort to bring those believers doing them back in line with the will of God. You talk to them personally. All right. Second, and their embarrassment, it shows them the shame attached to those deeds. You know, I found out that, uh, well, I saw you doing something the other day and I was really puzzled and I was rather concerned about you. I saw you going to that particular bar. I was driving by and I thought that was your car and I danced over there and I saw you. What I thought was you, was that you? Oh, no, no, it wasn't me. Okay, if you say so. But if it was, and you can have this in your attitude, have your own concern and your love for that person. Do you need some help with alcohol? Do you need some help with something else? I'm here. You see, these, these deeds are nothing but destructive to them. Your fellow believers. The third reason we'd want to mention them, it shows that, uh, first of all, uh, what they are doing, what they produce, is so unworthy that they don't want to bring it to the light. And yet it's the light that shows what is good, righteous, and of the truth. And that's a principle we learned earlier. 
So, first, it's an effort to bring those believers doing them back in line with the will of God. Secondly, in their embarrassment, it shows the shame attached to those deeds. They're nothing but destructive to them and their fellow believers. And third, it shows that what they do, what they produce, should be worthy of exposure to the light of truth that shows what is good, righteous, and of truth. So, it just shows the other side of the coin. If they don't want to do it, then it must be bad. Paul explains what happens when they're exposed in verse 13. I want to read that verse to you. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Some versions place this last phrase that says, for everything that becomes visible is light, at the beginning of the next verse. I'm going to include it here. I think it fits better. It begins, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. Now, that's a principle that we uh, understand and an analogy we can understand. The idea is that once one's shameful acts are talked about, someone's exposed. Now they're in the open, brought out into the light. They become visible or made known with those deeds Nothing is missed. That's the idea. People see it, including their fellow believers. God always saw it, even in the dark. And this links back to verse 11 and the unfruitful uh, works of darkness, deeds of darkness. And then we have this rather strong phrase, for everything that becomes visible is light. It's called light. Four explains it. All right, so there's your word of explanation. Four. And this takes the uh, exposure a step further. This gives room for a transition to take place. Now listen to this. Once the deeds of darkness are made known, the truth of the matter is made visible. The believer who steps out of darkness is now visible in the light. Another principle is clear from related scripture. Everything hidden or done in secret will be made visible. That's a pretty strong statement too. Mark 4.22, listen to this. For nothing is hidden except to be revealed. Nothing has anything, nothing has anything been secret, nor has anything been secret, except that it would come, and uh, the word there to, to light is not there, to light. Okay. Let me just fix that right quick. It goes off screen sometime uh, because of the margin. So one more time, Matthew four, excuse me, Mark four twenty two. I'll try to read it right this time. For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret except that it would come to light. The attitude of the believer who is walking with the Lord. John 3.21, listen to this. But he who practices the truth comes to the light in order that his deeds might be manifested as done in God. If you're familiar with the book of 1 John, that has a lot to do, uh, has a lot to do with light. There's a great deal to say about this subject as well. So what is this telling us? It is actually to our advantage as Christians that hidden sins be made known. We need to walk in the light all the time, producing deeds of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Those do not need to be hidden and won't be. And don't forget this. The light exposes what kind of believer you are and what kind of fruit you produce. One thing we know about believers is that when they are around other believers in a church or community, even family, they hide their sins. They do not want to make them known to others. And this is what Paul is addressing. Folks, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to challenge you. And I've already challenged myself many times. If you're doing things in secret, stop it. Now, unbelievers largely do not hide their sins 
unless they're being sneaky about it for some other unscrupulous reason. They'll leave them right out in the open. That's why some believers who are weak will be very comfortable with unbelievers. Their hidden sins are being conducted out in the open by unbelievers. They don't feel so ashamed by them. <laughs> That's a twist. Well, Paul's already pointed out how unbelievers live out their sin. Their reasoning process is dark with a hard heart. It's callous. Remember? Giving themselves over to indecency for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness? Well, we've had quite a bit of self-examination today. At least I hope we have. A lot of things we need to fix in our own lives. If that's the case, you take it to heart. You do what you need to do. I guess one of the nice things about here, uh, about being over a uh, video like this, I don't see your faces. <laughs> I don't see your expressions or your guilt. And that might be a good thing. So you have to deal with this on your own. It's between you and the Lord, first of all. So make sure you're dealing with those hidden sins. Now, next time, Paul will charge. By that, I mean he will challenge in strong terms for believers to get right. So you're going to really get it next time. Or I should say, we're all going to get it next time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. It's been a real challenge today. We thank you that you love us so much that we need to address these situations in our own hearts, in our own minds. Help us deal with our own hidden sin to bring it to light. We know you already see it, so we might as well deal with it right and live as children of light. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.